So one to update with um, our brother Ed as he is in the hospital waiting for further tests. He is scheduled to have an MRI tomorrow, uh, some point in time during the day. And then once they have those results from that MRI, then they'll determine what to do with the uh, defibrillator. I've been practicing that all afternoon, and I knew I was not going to get it, so I hope you know what I just said. Uh, with that, they will determine what to do, but they are trying to figure out some things. But again, he's going to have that MRI scheduled for sometime tomorrow, uh, and then they will decide what to do from there. So please continue to pray for him. Uh, I know you are, but also don't forget Sue, who is, who is right there. Uh, she's waiting, and of course, the entire family as well. So just remember them. As updates come out, we'll make sure that everybody gets those as soon as possible. Uh, I know that texting is good. I know that they've re still requested no visitors, but texting, a phone call, something of that nature would always be beneficial, as you know. And you, you all do that so well, and uh, you'd be commended of that. So to borrow Paul's words from this morning, just do that more and more. Can't ever get enough of that. So First Timothy is where we are going to be tonight. Uh, we got into the last chapter last week. We talked about this um, topic, if you will, of bond servants. Those of you that may have a version that speaks of it or translates it as slavery. Uh, and so we discussed that. I want to um, speak of something, and it's actually what Bill and I talked about afterwards. And I had it in my notes, and I just completely skipped over it. Uh, but two times, Paul will say that the reason we want you, th those who are slaves, those who are bond servants, to honor your masters, to work within the, frame, uh, the framework that you're in, the system that you're in, if you will, is more than anything else so that the name of God is not reviled and the teaching is not reviled. So two things at play. We don't want God to have a bad name because of who we are and how we act, and we don't want the teaching, i.e. we don't want the gospel, which is a message of transformation as much as it is anything else, to be reviled because we are not transforming. We are not changing. We're not being transformed in the image. Uh, but Bill reminded me, and I don't know if you remember this or not, but the original word for that is actually blaspheme. So if you wanted to substitute a word, it takes on a little bit more of a deeper, more stinging aspect when he says, we don't want the name of God to be blasphemed. And we don't want the teaching to be blasphemed. So if you're reading that in the original language, what are, what, what's hitting you? Yeah, it, it's one of those words that was transliterated. Blasphemo, isn't that? It's yes, true. yes, just like baptism. Uh, it's transliterated. We made it into something else and we realized that it, would, it fell short. So we, we used a word in our English language, revile, but we lost something in that. It's one of those where we lost that aspect of it. Uh, go ahead, Adam. Not even to speak God's name. Okay. And even when they wrote it, they were careful not to even write the whole name out correctly. Good point. That was blasphemy. So when Jesus is doing things in the name of God, saying He's His Son, they view it as blasphemy. Yes. So, so we remember we that. I, and that's one of the things that my mind went to was that Jesus is accused of blasphemy, and even Jesus will admit blasphemy. Blasphemy is the unforgivable sin, and blasphemy is not the uh, taking the Lord's name in vain, curse word as we would think, it's associated with disbelief. And it makes sense. You cannot be forgiven of disbelief while you're in disbelief. Uh, the one that, again, Hebrews eleven six, you're come to God, you must believe that he exists. So the idea of blasphemy is that you don't believe. An individual doesn't believe. I blaspheme the name of God, number one, because I don't believe. But then the other is then just the life that goes with it. And then the Jews took it to a little bit of a deeper level. We're not even going to write the name. We're just going to come up with something else and find that out. Uh, if, you're in the, if you're in Ephesus, and Paul is read, uh, this is being read from a pulpit, and you hear in your language, don't allow the name of God to be blasphemed. Don't conduct yourself in such a way where the name of God is blasphemed and or the teaching is blasphemed. What are, what's hitting you in your heart and in your mind when you hear that? Okay, it could be curse. Deny God. Denying God. I'm thinking more like if the way I behave as a slave, if my master is going to blaspheme God because of my behavior, yep. that's that's a whole different picture. You know, in as an individual. 
individualist, I tend to want to say, oh, that's my master's problem, not mine. But what he seems to be saying is, as a slave, if you create a master to blaspheme God, you have a problem. Yep. If you, even in the context of slavery and servanthood, if your attitude and actions, and this, it's the marriage of the two, if attitudes and actions are so poor and so bottom-dwelling, if you will, that your master comes to the point where he would rather not believe in the God that you say to serve, then that's, that's terrible news. That somebody doesn't believe, not because they don't have the evidence, but somebody doesn't believe based on how I've acted in this particular place. Adam? So, remember what Paul was accused of in blasphemy, Artemis. Yes. The statue of Artemis. And so they were ready to charge up at him just for that. Yep. So take it to a great extent when we talk about our God. And our God is far greater yes. than the Ephesus that it, uh, Artemis is. Sure, it is. Absolutely, you're right. So in, in, in Acts 19, when he's in Ephesus... And a riot starts because he's taking away the belief of Artemis and transferring it, if you will, to the belief into the one true God. People are going to riot, and they do. Uh, and it's only by providence that somebody intervenes and says, hey, just continue. If, if it's of God, it'll continue. If not, it'll die and go away, uh, which is some wisdom for us today. When things, when things happen, y'all notice things happen and then they go away? Y'all notice that in our country? What do we find? That's something to be aware of in that. Uh, what is and isn't of God. But the, the reason I wanted to start here, and this is for all of us, from the youngest of us that understand what I'm about to say to the oldest of us. We don't need to be responsible. We cannot afford to conduct ourselves in any aspect of our life to where somebody ends up not believing. And it's possible possible that we can conduct ourselves and how I wish that one of the things that we would build our filters around of the things that we think and say and do all of us as individual Christians and as a group that one of those filters would be if I think this if I say this if I do this how does this reflect on my God how does this reflect on him uh, you probably heard it those of you that are older don't bring reproach on the church. That's the same concept. Don't bring reproach. Don't bring reproach on the name. Influence matters. Attitude matters. Who I am matters. Who I treat my, if I'm an, if I'm an employee, who I, how I treat my employer. If I'm an employer, how I treat my employee. All of this, there are no excuses for me to act in such a way, in a continual way, that somebody ends up not believing. That's how serious this is. Paul says you conduct yourself. Here are the reasons. And two of them. Don't let God be blasphemed because of you. And don't let the gospel be blasphemed. Go ahead, Gary. I've got a problem in getting from where we were to where we are. Okay. I, I know we are where we are. I just got to figure out how we got there. How we got there. That's fine. We can retrace our steps. All right. So, let me. I'm looking. I'm looking at. Verse 1. Correct. So that the name of God and the teaching may not be revived. Right. That's what my... Correct. Said. Okay. Correct. Now, but because of what Glenn said, which I didn't totally understand because I, I was playing catch up, I guess. Now we are saying that's blasphemy. In the original language, instead of being translated as revile, the more accurate translation would be blasphemy. So that the name of God is not blasphemed. And, and the original language, when are you talking about that translation? When that is being written in real time by the Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Spirit. In the, in the original language, he would say, it would be translated as so that the name of God is not blasphemed. Yeah, we got to we got to the point part of our English language. This is just language in general. If you know anything, if any of us know anything with language and I and English is just as complex or one of the more complex languages there is. 
But when you're going from one language to another, and you're trying to capture the idea of what the passage is, a translator's got two options. Translators, I should say, because it's normally gr- it's groups. But translators have two options. Either I literally translate this word. I just take it word for word, literally. Or I try to f- capture a word in my language that captures the idea of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, 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 been there, I understand, in other, particularly in other places. So, we tonight believe or think that the word blasphemy is, or blasphemy is, is a more appropriate one than revive. Correct. Shoo, I I know. I know. I know. And I guess the, the reason why they just asked this, so it won't, yeah. won't, won't, won't confirm that I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, blasphemy to me, always, because of my whole history, sure. is really a scary situation. It is. That's something you just don't even tiptoe up on. I agree. Yes. And, and, and there are multiple things that people sometimes do or think or say that that I've even cautioned my own kids and yep. don't go there. Don't I, go there. I agree. But in this case where here is a servant mm-hmm. who is because maybe of what he believes, mm-hmm. Christianity, is beginning to take issue with the relationship with his master. Correct. I'm having a hard time getting blessed for him. If you look at it and and see right at the uh, page turn. So verse 1, let all who are under a yoke of bondservants. So right there he identifies who he's specifically speaking to. Those of you that are that are slaves. Regard your masters as worthy of all honor. Here's what I want you to do. Right. All honor. Here's here's your regarding. I don't want you to just think that, but I want you to speak of um, Speak of them that way, but speak to them that way. And then act, obviously, in that way as well. So the idea is that a servant, a slave would have come in in Ephesus and said, you know what, last night, Gary, I went into the water and I came out as a new Christian. You can't talk to me the way you talk to me. You cannot. I'm not going to do what you said. You're an unbeliever. He would be reviling, yes. (laughs) The reviling, the layer of this is in such a way, though, and we've heard this in other settings. Can you believe that so-and-so says that they are a Christian? Have you ever heard somebody else say that in your workplace? I can't believe that somebody who said that they were a Christian acted this way. You've heard that before? It's the continual. It's not a one time I just lost my patience and I just lost control. That happens to everybody. This is somebody who goes in and says, I have one master, it's the Lord, and he's the only one who can tell me what to do. And I'm not going to listen, I'm not going to do it, to the point where verbally, I verbally start, who are you? It, that makes sense? You know, but for me, that helps. So, so the reviling, yeah, so the reviling, so going back to a moment for the translating, What they captured when they translated and put it into English as revile, that's what they're capturing. It's not the end result of the reviling. It's the act of reviling itself. Does that make sense? And what Paul does in that original word, what what the Spirit wants to communicate, is that it's actually all of it. Because if you do that enough, if we have that attitude enough, that master is going to get to the point and say, but you, went, you said you had to go to church, but you're acting this way here? What? Why would I want to be part of that? Why, why would, so the blasphemy, and by the way, it's, as a side note, um, and not to put Justin on the spot, but we've talked about this some, is that it's multi-layered. So be, non-belief is an aspect of it, but it's also to take what's attributed to God. This is what they did with Jesus, Adam is to take what attributed to God, Jesus is doing the work of God, and actually attribute it to the work of Satan. That's what they're doing. So the blasphemy isn't just the non-belief, but then I'm going to take what God is doing here, in and through Christ, and actually say he's doing it by Beelzebub. Does that make sense? 
to everybody? Is everybody following? And then if you want to go to practical layers, it would be what Jack said, cursing God, using the name in vain in ways that hopefully we would never use them. Uh, hopefully we wouldn't utter those types of things. This is a multi-layered, multi-faceted thing just captured in one word, if you will. English just doesn't have a good word for that. Uh, maybe gave you more than what, what you were looking for. <laughs> no, 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 you didn't drag because this is, this is where the rubber meets the road for us. Because if we haven't been there or are not there, at some point we will work with somebody or under somebody that is just going to test us. And, and in that sense, above it all, is you maintain your composure. Because it's not about how you are. There's still an element. Don't get me wrong. Don't be a, don't be a um, doormat. You know, there's respect. But there's also this Christ who, when he was reviled, did not open his mouth. And the reason is, is because I would much rather take this and maintain an open door for the possibility of the gospel than I would anything else. But that's, that's the practical, that's the rubber meets the road. Because you may be working with someone right now who just is terrible in their own way. So I, a lot of people were raising their hands, so I know you, we'll start with you, Bill. Yes. What it is to be a Christian. And if we are teaching in error, we are blaspheming. We are causing the name of God to be verbally abused in a manner. Yeah. So and I just had a hard time coming up with an English word. It, yeah, because English, I mean, for all the words we've got. Reviled words. Reviled means people are going to think less of God right. because of your action. Yeah. So, so what you mentioned, Gary, though, if you take those elements and marry them, Paul is, Paul is opening up the band-aid and he is saying, if you continue as a church to do, but specifically these false teachers, if you continue to do what you're doing, it isn't just your soul that's at stake now. It's others. Which is a side note for all of us who would get up. I'd say it's a broken record. You get up here and speak, you need to know what you're talking about. As best as you possibly can. Adam and the Jeff. He did. And that's what he's conveying here. To help him understand the Hebrew concept as well as the Greek concept and bring in the full meaning of taking God's name in vain because he is the creator. Yep. Jeff. I'm going to try and make Gary feel better by telling you that he's been crazy as a football. Because we're more used to thinking, uh, as we were praying along with Dennis, that our, our, our uh, idea about behavior is in conflict with the culture around us. But in this case, Paul is counseling, you, you need to match society's expectations. And I've just kind of been turning that over in my brain and... Yeah, if you want to take Paul in Corinth, uh, you need to live as you've been called. Uh, you know, so you remain where you're at. Now, we talked about it last week. If, you have the if you're a slave and you have the opportunity for freedom, by all means, use it and take full advantage of it. Uh, but if you don't, live as you're called. And you work from the bottom up, inside out, to bring about the change that you would desire. Um, were there Christian slaves? Yeah. There's Onesimus. Was it possible that Philemon beat him? It's very possible. 
Is it possible that he just treated him as an indentured servant? That's possible too. There's a wide variety and wide range of meaning with that. But coming out of the water, and this is to your point, Jeff, coming out of the water doesn't stop you from being who you are when you, leave, when you go. It doesn't stop you from being a man. It doesn't stop you from being a woman. It doesn't stop you from being an employer. It doesn't stop you from being an employee. It doesn't stop you from being a father. It doesn't stop you from being a mother. It doesn't stop you from living within the confines and the boundaries of the current society. What it does do is it gives you a different approach in how you enter into that society. And here's the maximum part of that society. To bring the gospel to that society. Even, even if it's, it's managing the expectations of it, if you will. Tom? You know, he doesn't say here, going back to what you're saying, give honor to those that deserve honor. Give, word, be, you know, give worthiness to those that are worthy. He says, you be the right person in every situation, whether you find yourself in a bad situation or a good situation. Yep. You always be what's right so that you won't cause anybody to have disbelief. And Correct. bring repute, essentially, on the name of God and the teaching that you have obeyed. Yep. So no matter what situation or environment or good bond servant, bad bond servant, you bring glory and honor to the name of Christ. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah it is, because that's the goal. That's the purpose, right? To live for Christ, to die is gain. There's a lot of purpose statements. Now, again, if the situation is bad, if the workplace is bad, no one is saying just suck it up and deal with it. No, if you can change it, even if it's just changing from one place to another, that's fine. There are, use your wisdom and deal with that. But until then, until that happens, there is no excuse to change in such a way your treatment of another person. Even your master is worthy of all honor by virtue of who he is. Is his behavior? No. But you're not going to change his behavior by screaming and yelling and disobeying. How's behavior changed? Inside out. By what? The gospel. And if the gospel doesn't have free reign, if I don't consider myself as a vessel, and this is, this is a view that Paul took of himself in Corinth, I'm just a vessel. Just an earthen vessel. You were raising your hand in then Harry. My thinking was a lot like Tom's. It, it's a different paradigm. It's not a paradigm of hierarchy. The paradigm of hierarchy is a worldly paradigm. And the spiritual paradigm is we're all the same and equal before the Lord. The Lord wants all of us to be saved. Yes. No matter where we might be. And what's interesting listening to you is the, I'll call it the irony. The irony is the slave would tend to want to revile the master. But the, and, and hope, at the same time, he wants to be respected as a person, mm -hmm. right? I'm just as valuable as you are, even though I'm a slave. You should respect me. And, but you don't gain respect by reviling back or being sarcastic or fighting or, as you just illustrated, that's not what you, that's not going to get it. In fact, it's love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. Do unto others as you have them do unto you. Those are the principles and if you're teaching me those principles, but then you revile me, I'm going to blaspheme your God because you're, you mm -hmm. know, you don't really, your God doesn't make any difference. Yep. He hasn't changed you. you. It, but <laughs> it, he hasn't changed you. Yeah. And that is the point. I, I live so that my God is not reviled. It's not about me reviling. Yep. It's about I live so my God isn't reviled. I mean, that that's heavy duty on that slave. And I can tell yep. you, I've had some bosses I didn't agree with the principles of. And I talked bad about them. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't have. And, and so, it, even yep. sometimes to their face. And I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, I was actually going to get reviled back, which is what happened. Right? Maybe I should have shown respect to my neighbor. So, yep. he's, a, he's not my boss. He's my neighbor. It's a different paradigm. It's a neighbor, and, it's, and even further, it's one for whom Christ died. And, and here's the thing, even when we respect, even if there is a, and I just can say Justin again because you're just right there and I know we talk about it. But even if, even if I'm working under Justin, I report to Justin, there's a problem. It's not saying not deal with it, but how does the gospel empower me to approach that and to deal with it? And if we try several times and it doesn't work, then there's a different story. And if there's, a, if there's an exit stage right, then go ahead, take that opportunity. But until then, how does the gospel help with 
with um, the, the animosity that may exist or whatever else. And here's the thing. We sometimes expect the other person to do what we really are supposed to be doing. So this morning, love is patient, love is kind, love is sacrificial. Why am I expecting the other person to sacrifice? I don't know if that's their paradigm or not. I don't know if that's their belief system. But what I do know is when I woke up this morning, that's mine. Because that was my Lord's. So I can't. And this is the conversation that Peter has with Jesus at the very end. Jesus has a conversation with two conversations with Peter at the end of the Gospel of John. One's to restore him. The other is Peter and, and John, Jesus tells John, hey, the one that I love, he won't see death until the kingdom comes. Y'all remember that? The end of the Gospel of John? And Peter's walking along and Peter just as he does. Hey, you said this about John, by the way. What do you, what do you mean by all of that? And the Lord looks at him and says, what is that to you? If he lives until I come back, what does that change about your discipleship? You follow me. The Gospel of John ends with the same exact words that Jesus told Peter at the beginning. You follow me. Whatever's happening among us, whatever's happening at work, I know we would want to change it and we should bring the Gospel into that. But what's it to me if you're living that way? I follow him. What's it to me? There are so many of us who want to bring that change. And here's how the change is brought. The only thing that I bring. And I don't bring the change. I bring the gospel that brings about the change. But it's got to make a difference in my life. It's got to show, uh, show that. Go ahead. Well, a personal experience as a babe in Christ and a Marine. Uh, one day on base, one of the sisters who was the wife of an officer drove by and I said hi and walked up and was greeting her my normal way, hugs and all that. And I got chastised because it was an officer's wife and I was enlisted. And that's the same principle that we're talking about, showing respect to those even though we are children of God. We still have to show that worldly respect that they are honored with. Sure, sure. Harry, you were raising your hand a minute ago. Well, this is back to Gary's... Uh, Point about the word revival in the English. Uh, Merriam Webster um, has a, a, a synonym, and it, what, what it says here apparently there is some discrepancy in what revival actually means to us because it says common synonyms of revival are berate, rail, scold, and upbraid. And while these words mean to reproach angrily and abusively, revile implies a scurrilous, abusive attack prompted by anger or hatred. So we've caused anger or hatred towards God or to his doctrine, um, not just, you know, causing them to berate us or put us down, but yep. it, we've generated a deep, hurtful emotion. Yeah. And it, it's, uh, so Gary, we could have just stopped with what you said a second ago. It's a heavy, that's a heavy concept yeah. in reality, not just concept. <laughs> I'm not saying to stop. <laughs> of, of, of multiple circumstances that I think I could duplicate the situation that Paul is addressing, yeah. but we wouldn't answer it that way. But it's okay. I mean, that's just one of those things. No, no, it is, but that's, that's the probing of the scripture that is alive and sharper than a two edged sword because it needs to cut to the very heart. At the end of the day, look, influence isn't just salt and light. Influence can be not just negative, it can be detrimental. Here's the thing with the detrimentalness. It's now just not me that it's detrimental to. It changes the whole concept of who I'm supposed to be. And I know we're kind of putting it in the concept of worker and non-employer uh, uh, and employee. Marriages are this way. Who we are among each other is this way. Who you are in line is this way. Who I am at the red light is this way. Because I have people in the car with me. Right? There, I mean, this is, this is, this permeates everything. This is who I am when I, when it's, it's a hundred degrees and I'm waiting in line. It's, it's what if I look at it and say, 
if this thing, if my influence has so much power, I need to, I think that's why that word is there, to make us feel the possible weight of the negative aspect of this. It's not that it's real in the sense that it's happening. The false teachers are doing their element. It's not like the entire church is this way. But he is telling everybody, if you're not careful with who you are, teacher or not, leader or not, it can be detrimental. That, that'll keep you up. Keeps you up. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. It, it, once it's out, it's out. And, and you work almost five or ten times, not even twice as hard, but ten times as hard just to make up because that, for whatever reason, it's just like our little ones. All the bad stuff, it sticks like glue. And all the good stuff, you'll wonder what happened to it, right? It's the same thing, though. One negative encounter with somebody who is a so-called Christian will dictate the rest of an individual's life. And it will undo the work of ten. If, 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 if you've been around the block a half the time, you, you've heard that too many times for real. Yes. Well, when I was 18 years old, I observed so and so. It's horrible to hear those stories. It is. It and is. They're real. It is. And they're real. Uh, and it's it. And here's the thing. Paul says it's not just. It's not a them. What is me? You were raising your hand a second ago. Yeah, I, I listened to your statement, and I, 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 can, ima I can imagine that uh, even if I was allowed to be free as a slave, that it might not be the spiritual thing to actually leave my master. There could be occasions for the sake of my master that I remain as his slave for his sake. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm given the opportunity for freedom. Yeah. So it's not like it's just if I get the opportunity, okay, go. That's a, it's a different paradigm. The paradigm is what's best for the person I'm with, not what's best for me, mm -hmm. not my rights, yeah. not my fight. What's best for the person I'm with and the role I have. Yep. That's an incredible. I mean, I've seen a movie where that was brought out in American history with. With, uh, with with black maids, right? Yeah. And and the choice was to stay for the sake of the family that to go. Yeah. And so it, I could see that. And Jesus, Jesus would say, that's, that's not going one mile, that's going two. That's, right. that's the second mile when you have the opportunity to stop and you go you go a different, I mean, you go further than what's expected. Go ahead, I'm sorry. This might you. help carry or make it worse. <laughs> 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 Blasphemy is used just above this. In... Uh, Timothy 2, um, there is a place where he's talking about Hymenaeus, mm -hmm. and he says, by rejecting their faith and good conscience have some shipwreck to faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've delivered over to Satan so that they might be taught through punishment not to blaspheme. Yeah. And the translators chose blaspheme there yeah. instead of reviling. And that's chapter 1, verse 20, if, if you're looking at it. But no, you're right. They chose, and, and that is, so that's a connecting. And there are real names now. And again, notice, notice the imagery, and we covered that. Here are two men. Here's what they're doing. But they shipwrecked, not just theirs. They've shipwrecked all the, yep. Yeah. And just think about that. And you, what, do you need an image of a shipwreck? Probably not. You don't need a picture. You know exactly what that is. Uh, the stressing, uh, and we've talked about it for 45 minutes. I wasn't, expe I wasn't expecting that, but that's good. <laughs> because it's, it's this. It, it is the age-old but most power, one of the most powerful things. Go ahead. Whether they want to, whether they do or not, is, is only on them. 
it doesn't take the burden off the no. person that, that did the wrong that caused it, but they're still because um, my story would be that when I was growing up, that very thing I thought, that person says he's a Christian, but there's sure a lot of alcohol going through him, you know, and on Sunday morning, he's all against it, you know, but yet on Saturday night, he's all full of it. Well, thankfully, I didn't let that influence me totally that he's not going to keep me from going to heaven. I'm still going to go, and maybe I can turn him around, but that didn't happen. But anyway, like I say, there's, there's that responsibility of individuality. I guess is what I'm trying to get across. No, there is. And, no. And that while we do things, we have to be cognizant of that, how they may affect people, and how it may turn them off, or just because we <coughs> we're for something or against something, even that in and in of itself can turn people off. Well, no, it, it is. And, and that's the thing. I mean, if somebody doesn't believe because they can't handle what God's word says in terms of truth, then the quarrel is not with us. And that's something that we have a problem with, that somebody doesn't believe because this, the truth is that. Well, it, that is such, such something that that's, that's there and that's that we don't need to lose sleep over that. However, you're right on two aspects of it. On one, it doesn't absolve an individual of their of that journey to faith, if you will, and hopefully obedience to the gospel. Uh, on the second, and the second though, what Paul would, would emphasize is what we've emphasized all, all evening. Be aware of who you are, because, and, and this is where I wanted, to claim, I wanted to end with this. Paul will say for the fifth time in six chapters, teach and urge these things. There is a sense of urgency. There is no time to waste on a poor pitiful influence that is detrimental to somebody. No time. You mentioned this in your prayer, that we would be motivated to work. There is a sense of urgency, and it's not just a fix, but there is a, there is a whole eternity that is at stake. And for some, not for all, but for some, they've made an eternal decision based on the influence, or quite simply, the lack thereof, of a Christian. Now think about that, friend. That's a long time to reflect on how influential I was to somebody in said scenario. Adam, real quick, and then Gary. Context. The context of verse 1 is Paul emphasizing that that master that you serve is worthy of honor. Yes. And not only are you insulting that, that master, he's a Christian you're insulting God because you're a Christian. Using the microphone, could you repeat Bill's uh, scripture? It, mean, was, it was 1 Timothy 1, verse 20. Okay. That's all. And that's what is the same word that's translated as revile in chapter 6. It's the same word. They just went with blaspheme instead of. And shipwrecked, not just themselves, but others. All right, so I just leave you with that. They leave here with a sense of urgency to be exactly who God wants you to be in all aspects of your life. And to realize that purpose as a Christian, once we come out, go in the water and come out, it's all about Him. It's all about the message. It's all about the Lord. And does that mean that we're going to meet some things that we would wish to change like, like that? Yeah. But it's not going to happen. So how can the gospel translate into this? What does it look like for me to sacrifice? Fill in the blank. So that this other person not only will see Jesus, but perhaps, just perhaps, will ask one day, tell me about him. Because I see how you act. And I would have acted in a lot of a different way. That's powerful stuff. Right there. Just think about it. Let's have a word of prayer. If you have not had an opportunity to partake of communion. It's left in the hallway to my right. You're left. Somebody will meet you there. And you can partake of it together. Let's pray. Father you are good to us. And we're thankful. In all of this discussion tonight. About um, 
influence and really the internal implications, not just earthly implications, but even more than that, the eternal ones. Father, we pray that we will sit for just a moment and reflect on who we are today and all the aspects that make up our life and how our influence has been met, even if that influence is just within our home with our spouses, our children. Father, are people believing or disbelieving because of us? We pray, Father, that we conduct ourselves in such a way with our words, with our actions, with our treatment of other people, uh, believers or not, that that is beside the point, that we will conduct ourselves in such a way that reflects Jesus. Because that's the one that we say that we follow anyway. That's the one that today we have given time this morning and time this evening to worship and to give praise and to give honor. Father, help us to not leave that honor here in this place, but to bring honor to you in the workplace, in the home place, and wherever else we find ourselves. And perhaps, just perhaps, that and a combination of other things will soften the heart of an individual who wants to know more about Christ. And that gives us an opportunity that instead of bringing reviling, we can, we can bring glory. We pray, Father, that we will be the vessels that you would have us be. That we would have the humility, the servitude, that we would have the love to do that for the person that may be treating us in ways that we don't expect to be kind, to be good, but they're doing it. We pray, Father, for the fortitude to persevere and to change them by bringing them into contact with the good news of Jesus. Father, we pray for our brother Ed as he, he's in the hospital, facing numerous things, things that are unknown to doctors and to family at the moment. I know that an MRI, that if, if it would be your will that we have tomorrow, an MRI is scheduled. We pray for not just good results, but results that would, would give wisdom to the doctors on how to approach what's going on with him. Until that time comes, we pray, Father, that you will, you will bless them as a family, that you will love them, that you will support them, that you will carry them through this, and that you will be with them, and that we as a family would continue to rush to their aid as much as we can to support them, to encourage them, and to love them as well. Father, we thank you for this day and all that has meant to us. In Jesus' name we pray.